Section 11 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sea Terror, by Captain S. P. Meek, Part 3. Once we had the place spotted, we sent a gang in and captured the whole works without any trouble. The underground cavern had no natural opening to the surface, but one had been made by blasting. We captured the whole lot and then sealed the end of the hole with rock and concrete. That was the end of the affair. Thank you, Commander. You have given us a very graphic description of it. I suppose you could find the entrance which was sealed up? Easily. I led the raiding party. I forgot to mention one blunder we made. Evidently some word of our plans leaked out, for the sub which was guarding the outer end of the tunnel was called away by a radio message. Supposed to be from the Navy Department. It had gone only a short distance, however, when the commander smelled a rat and made his way back. He was too late. He was just in time to see the sub emerge from the hole and head into the open sea. He gave chase, but the other sub was faster than the Navy boat, and it got clear away. The leader of the gang must have been on it, for we didn't get him. Who was the leader? From some records we captured, his name was Ivan Saranoff. I never saw him. Saranoff, said Dr. Bird thoughtfully. The name seems familiar. Where have I— Thunder, I know now. He was at one time a member of the faculty of St. Petersburg. He was one of the leading biologists of his time. Carnes, we've found our man. If you are thinking of Saranoff, I am afraid you are mistaken, doctor, said Commander Minden. Neither he nor his submarine have ever been heard of since it has been generally conceded that they were lost at sea. We had some pretty rough weather just after that affair. Rough weather doesn't mean much to a sub, Commander. I expect that he's our man. At any rate, the place we want to go is the end of that tunnel. I'm at your service, doctor. Carnes, get the location of that tunnel entrance from Commander Minden and order the Miniconson to proceed north along the coast to that vicinity and stand by for radio orders. I'm going to telephone Mitchell Field and get a plane. We have no time to lose. The plane from Mitchell Field roared down to a landing, and Carnes, Dr. Bird, and Commander Minden dismounted from the rear cockpit and looked around. They had landed in a smooth field at the base of a rise almost rugged enough to be called a mountain. A group of three men were standing near them as they got out of the plane. One of the men approached. "'Dr. Bird?' asked the newcomer. "'I am Tom Harron, United States Marshal. These two men are deputies. I understand that I am to report to you for orders.' "'I am glad to know you, Mr. Harron. This is Operative Carnes of the Secret Service and Commander Minden of the Coast Guard. We are going to explore an underground cavern that is located in this vicinity. Do you mean the one where they used to smuggle aliens? That is closed up. I was in charge of that work, and we closed it tight as a drum two years ago. Can you find the entrance? Sure. It isn't over a mile from here. Lead the way, then. We want to take a look at it. The marshal led the way toward the eminence and took a path which led up a gully in its side. He paused for a moment to take his bearings, and then turned sharply to his left and climbed part way up the side of the ravine. "'Here it is,' he announced. An expression of astonishment crossed his face, and he examined the ground closely. "'By golly, Doc,' he went on as he straightened up, "'this place has been opened since I left it.' Dr. Bird hurried forward and joined him. The heavy stone and concrete with which the entrance to the cavern had been sealed were undisturbed, but in the side of the hill was set a steel door beside the concrete. There was no sign of a keyhole or other means of entering it. "'Was this steel door part of your work?' asked Carnes. "'No, sir, it wasn't. We sealed it solid. That door has been put there since.' Dr. Bird closely examined the structure. He tapped it and went around the edges and then straightened up and took a small pocket compass from his pocket and opened the case. The needle swung crazily for a moment and then pointed straight toward the door. "'A magnetic lock!' he exclaimed. "'If we could find the power line it would be easy to force. But finding that line might take us a week. At any rate, we have found out what we were after. This is their base from which they are operating. Mr. Harron, I want you to station a guard armed with rifles at this door day and night until I personally relieve you. Remember, until I relieve you in person. Verbal or written orders don't go. Capture or kill anyone who tries to enter or leave the cavern through this entrance. Just now we'll find that cavern more vulnerable from the sea end. 
and that is where I mean to attack. We'll force that door and explore from this end later. Commander Minden, you may stay here with Mr. Heron, if you like, or you may come with Carnes and me. We are going on board the Miniconson. The Mitchell Field plane roared to a takeoff and bore south along the coast. Half an hour of flying brought them in view of the battleship steaming at full speed up the coast. Dr. Bird radioed instructions to the ship, and an hour later a launch picked them up from the beach and took them out. As soon as they were on board they resumed their progress, and in two hours the peak that Dr. Bird had marked as a landmark was opposite. "'Steam in as close to the shore as you can safely,' he said, "'and then lower us. Once we are down you will be guided by our telephoned instructions. Come on, Carnes, let's go.' The detective followed him into the sphere as the Miniconson edged up toward the shore. The huge ball was lifted from the deck and lowered gently into two hundred fathoms of water. It was pitch dark at that depth, and Dr. Bird switched on one floodlight and studied the cliff, which rose a hundred yards from them. "'We have missed the place, Carnes,' he said. "'We'll have them pull us up a few hundred feet and then steam along the coast.' He turned to the telephone, and the sphere rose while the battleship steamed slowly ahead, the vitrilene ball following in her wake. For a quarter of a mile they continued on their way, and then Dr. Bird halted the ship. "'What depth are we?' he asked. Eighty fathoms? All right. Lower us, please.' The ball sank until it rested on the sea-bottom, and Dr. Bird turned on two additional floodlights and studied the surroundings. The bed of the ocean was literally covered with lobster and crab shell, with the bones of fish scattered here and there among them. A few bones of land animals were mixed with the debris, and Carnes gave a gasp as Dr. Bird pointed out to him a diving helmet. "'We are on the right track,' said the scientist grimly. He stepped to the telephone and ordered the sphere raised to one hundred fathoms. The ship moved forward along the coast until Dr. Bird again stepped to the telephone and halted it. Before them yawned the entrance to the underground tunnel. It was about two hundred feet high and three hundred across, and their most powerful beams would not penetrate to the end of it. A pile of debris could be seen on the floor of the tunnel, and Carnes fancied that he could see another diving helmet among the litter. Dr. Bird pointed toward the side of the cavern. "'See those floodlights fastened to the cliffs so their beams will sweep across the mouth of the tunnel when they are lighted?' he said. "'Apparently the cave is used as a prison, and the light beams are the bars. The creature is not at home just now, or the bars would be up. My God, look at that, Carnes!' Carnes stared and echoed the doctor's cry of surprise. Clinging to a shelf of rock which extended out from the wall of the cavern, and half hidden among the seaweed, was a huge marine creature. It looked like a huge black slug with rudimentary eyes and mouth. The thing was fifty feet in length and fully fifteen feet in diameter. It hung there, moving sluggishly as though breathing, and rudimentary tentacles projecting from one end moved in the water. "'What is it, doctor?' asked Carnes in a voice of awe. It is a typical trochosphere of the giant octopus, the devil fish of Indian Ocean legend. Multiplied a thousand times, he replied. When the octopus lays its eggs, they hatch out into the larval form. The free-swimming larva is known as a trochosphere, and I am positive that that is what we see. But look at the size of the thing. Man alive, if that ever developed, I can't conceive of its dimensions." "'I have seen pictures of a huge octopus pulling down a ship,' said Carnes, "'but I always fancied they were imaginary. "'They are. "'This monstrosity before us is no product of nature. "'A dozen of them would depopulate the seas in a year. "'It is a hideous parody of nature, "'conceived in the brain of a madman "'and produced by some glandular disturbance. "'Saranoff spent years in glandular experimentation, "'and no doubt he has managed to stimulate the thyroid "'of a normal octopus and produce a giant.' I fancy that the immediate parent of the thing before us was of normal size, and so probably are its brothers and sisters. The phenomenon of giantism of this nature occurs in alternate generations, and then only in rare instances. Its grandparent may not be far away, however. I wish it was safe to use a submarine to explore that cavern. Why isn't it? Any creature powerful enough to pull the Arethusa under water would crush a frail submarine without effort. Anyway, a Navy sub isn't built for underwater exploration like this ball is. The window space is quite limited, and they aren't equipped with powerful floodlights. I would like to be able to reach that thing and destroy it. 
but it can wait until later. The best thing we can do is to put out our lights and wait. His hand sought the light switch, and the globe became dark. Only a tiny glimmer of light came down to them from the surface, a hundred fathoms above. In the darkness they stared into the depths of the sea. For an hour they waited, and then Dr. Bird grasped Carnes by the shoulder and pointed. Far in the distance could be seen a tiny point of light. It wavered and winked and at times disappeared, but it was gradually approaching them. Dr. Bird stepped to the telephone, and the Miniconson moved a hundred yards further from the shore. The light disappeared again as though hidden by some opaque body. Their eyes had become accustomed to the dim light, and they could see dimly a long snake-like body approach the globe and then suddenly withdraw. The light appeared again only a few hundred yards away. The water swirled and the sphere swayed drunkenly as some gigantic body moved past it with express train speed and entered the mouth of the cavern. The light turned toward them and they could see the dim outlines of a small submarine on which it was mounted. Another rush of water came as the object which had entered the cave started to leave it, and the light swung around. It bore on a huge black body, and was reflected with a red glow from huge eyes, and the creature backed again into the cave. Back and forth across the mouth of the cavern the light played, and the watchers caught a glimpse of a huge parrot beak which could have engulfed a freight car. From the cavern projected twisting tentacles of gargantuan dimensions, and red eyes, thirty feet in diameter, glared balefully at them. For several minutes the light of the submarine played across the mouth of the cave, and then the floodlights on the cliff sprang into full glow and bathed the ball and the mouth of the tunnel in a flood of light. Before their horrified gaze was an octopus of a size to make them disbelieve their eyes. The submarine had moved up to within a few feet of them and the light from it played full on the ball. The submarine maneuvered in the vicinity, keeping the ball full in the beam of its light, and then drew back. As it did so, the floodlights on the cliff died out, and the beam of the submarine's light was directed away from them. Dr. Bird jumped to the telephone. "'Head straight out to sea, and full speed ahead,' he shouted. "'Don't try to pull us in. Tow us.' The ball swayed as the Miniconson's mighty engines responded to his orders, and the cliff wall disappeared. "'As long as they know we're here, we might as well announce our presence in good style,' said the doctor grimly as he closed a switch and threw all of the sphere's huge lights into action. He had turned on the lights just in time, for even as he did so a mighty tentacle shot out of the darkness and wrapped itself around the ball. For a moment it clung there, and then was withdrawn. The thing can't stand light, remarked the doctor as he threw off the switch. That sub was hurting it like a cow by the use of a light beam. As long as we are lighted up, we are safe from attack. Then for God's sake, turn on the lights, cried Carnes. I want it to attack us, replied the doctor calmly. We have no offensive weapons, and only by meeting an attack can we harm the thing. As he spoke, there came a soft whisper of sound from the vitrilene walls, and they were thrown from their feet by a sudden jerk. Dr. Bird stumbled to the switch and closed it, and the ball was flooded with light. Two arms were now on them, but they were slowly withdrawn as the lights glared forth. The huge outlines of the beast could be seen as it followed them toward the surface. Its great eyes glared at them hungrily. The submarine was visible only as a speck of light in the distance. The Miniconson's speed was picking up under the urge of her huge steam turbines, and the ball was nearing the surface. The sea was light enough now that they could see for quite a distance. The telephone bell jangled, and Dr. Bird picked up the receiver from its hook. Hello, he said. What's that? You can? By all means, fire. Yes, indeed, we're well out of danger. We must be thirty or forty feet down. Watch the fun now, he went on to Carnes as he replaced the receiver. The beast is showing above the surface, and they're going to shell it. They watched the surface, and suddenly there came a flash of light followed by a dull boom of sound. The huge octopus suddenly sank below them, thrashing its arms about wildly. "'A hit!' shouted Dr. Bird into the telephone. "'Get it again if it shows up. I want it to get good and mad.' He turned off the lights in the ball, and the octopus attacked again. The shell had taught it caution, and it kept well down, but three huge arms came up from the depths of the sea and wrapped themselves about the ball. The forward motion stopped for a moment, and then came a jerk that threw them down. 
The ball started to sink. "'Our cable has parted,' cried the doctor. "'Turn on the lights.' Carnes closed the switch. The ball was so covered with the huge tentacles that they could see nothing, but the light had its usual effect, and they were released. The ball sank toward the bottom, and they could see the huge cephalopod lying below watching them. Blood was flowing from a wound near one of its eyes, where the Miniconson's shell had found its mark. Toward the huge monster they sank, until they lay on the bottom of the ocean, and a few yards from it. In an instant the sea became opaque, and they could see nothing. "'He has shot his ink,' cried the doctor. "'Here comes the real attack. Strap yourself to the wall where you can reach one of the motor switches.' Through the darkness huge arms came out and wrapped themselves around the ball. The heavy vitrilene groaned under the enormous pressure which was applied, but it held. The ink was clearing slightly, and they could see that the sphere was covered by the arms. The mass moved, and the huge maw opened before them. The pipes projecting from the sides of the ball were buried in the creature's flesh. "'Good Lord, he's going to swallow us!' gasped the doctor. "'Quick, Carnes, the motor switch!' He closed one of them as he spoke, and the powerful little electric motors began to hum, forcing forward the piston attached to the tank connected to the hollow rods. Steadily the little motors hummed, and the tank emptied through the rods into the body of the giant cephalopod. "'I hope the stuff works fast,' groaned the doctor, as they approached closer to the giant maw. "'I never tried giving an octopus a hypodermic injection of prussic acid before, but it ought to do the business. There's enough acid there to kill half of New York City.' Carnes blanched as the ball approached the mouth. One by one the arms unwound until only one was holding them, and the jaws opened wider. They were almost in them when the motion stopped. They could feel a shudder run through the arm which held them. For a moment the arm alternately expanded and contracted, almost releasing them only to clutch them again. Another arm came from the depths, and whipped about the ball, and again the vitrilene groaned at the pressure which was applied. The arms were suddenly withdrawn, and the ball started to sink. "'Drop the lead, Carnes,' cried the doctor. With the aid of the detective he operated the electric catches which held the huge mass of lead to the bottom and the sphere shot up through the water like a rocket. It leaped clear of the water and fell back with a splash. A half mile away the Miniconson was swinging in a wide circle to head back toward them. They turned their gaze toward the shore. As they looked a giant arm shot a hundred yards up into the air, twisting and writhing frantically. It disappeared, and another, and then half a dozen flashed into the air. The arms dipped below the surface. A huge black body reared its bulk free from the water for a moment, and the sea boiled as though in a violent storm. The body sank, and again the arms were thrown up, twisting and turning like a half-dozen huge snakes. The whole creature sank below the waves, and the ball tossed back and forth, often buried under tons of water, and once tossed thirty feet in the air by the huge waves. A momentary lull came in the waves. Carnes gave a cry of astonishment and pointed toward the shore. With an effort Dr. Bird twisted himself in his lashing and looked in that direction. The huge body had again come to the surface, and three of the arms were towering into the air. Grasped in them was a long black cigar-shaped object. As they watched, the object was torn into two parts and the fragments crushed by the enormous power of the octopus. Again the arms writhed in torment, and then they stiffened out. For a moment they towered in the air, and then slowly sank below the surface of the sea. "'The cyanide has worked,' cried the doctor, "'and in its last agonies the creature has turned on its creator and destroyed him. It is a shame, for Saranoff was a brilliant, although perverted, genius. And besides, I would have liked to have learned his method. However, I may find something when we open the land end and raid the cave. And really, he was too brilliant a man to hang for murder.' Once we open the cave and I get any data that is there, my connection with the case will end. Trailing down the gold and recovering it is a routine matter for Bolton, and one in which he won't need my help. What about that creature we saw in the cave, Doctor? Won't it hatch into another terror of the sea like the thing that destroyed the ship? The trochosphere? No, I'm not worried there. It won't try to leave the cave for some days yet, and by that time we'll have the land end opened and the floodlights turned on. They will keep it there, and it will starve to death. We could send down a sub to feed it a torpedo, but there's no need. Nature will dispose of it. Meanwhile, I hope the Miniconson 
rigs up a jury tackle pretty soon and takes us on board. I'm getting seasick. End of part three. And end of the sea terror by Captain S. P. Meek.